right. So thank you everybody for joining us at the October 26, 2021 Planning and Zoning Commission. This is a web-based call, so we're operating under the following procedures. Our meeting is being audio and video recorded. And a recording of the video will be available within 24 hours and will be posted to the Town of Waterford's Planning Department website. To ensure good sound quality, the default rule for this meeting is that everyone will remain on mute unless you are speaking. If any attendees create an audio or visual disruption, the Zoom moderator can place them on mute or remove them from the meeting if this continues. We will not be using the chat feature in this meeting. If you wish to, uh, we appreciate your attendance. And if you have any questions, you can certainly call the Planning and Development Office at 860-444-5813 between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Mark for roll. Okay, <clears throat> starting with the roll, Greg Massad. Here. John Bashaw. Tim Bleasdale. Here. Karen Barnett. Ken Petrini. Here. Joe DeBono. Okay, we have three responses. Okay, so we have a quorum. <clears throat> no need for an alternate, we don't have them. So, <clears throat> how about <clears throat> number two, approval of the October 12, 2021 meeting minutes. I'll move uh, approval of those minutes. I move by Tim. Seconded by. Uh, I'll second. Ken. Yes. All, right. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Three to nothing. All right. Item number three. Any receipt of applications, uh, Abby? No. No, no applications. No applications. Item number four. Any correspondence? No. No correspondence. Okay. Great. Item number five is discussion, 5A is discussion with the town attorney, Rob Avina, who's here concerning the recent advisory opinion issued by the Town of Waterford Ethics Commission. Um, attorney Avina. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, please be with you tonight. Um, I had a short conversation uh, with Greg just a short while ago, uh, just to, um, remind him that uh, I had been working with the Ethics Commission and they had recently circulated a new advisory opinion um, and that I've been trying to make the rounds uh, with various boards and commissions uh, in town uh, to try to answer any questions folks might have um, in, re in direct regard to the work that they do for the town and especially uh, all the volunteers uh, very much appreciated obviously um, so it makes a uh, interesting situation with planning and zoning because upon reflection, most of what the ethics advisory opinion is talking about is particular conflicts that may arise uh, when you're actually doing work that re uh, results in a vote uh, on town finances, uh, invoking particular uh, concerns that you might have uh, with particular town officials or members of your family that are involved in town government and, and whether or not you should act uh, on anything that's in front of you regarding such uh, relatives and friends. However, um, what we all know, and I can certainly talk a little bit more tonight and then take your personal questions uh, going forward, is that hopefully everybody is familiar that on a planning zoning commission, uh, you have both statutory uh, and ordinance related uh, conflicts uh, that you must be very careful of um, regarding usually the applicant so that when you see an application come across from Abby or Mark, you'll notice that there are butters to it. Uh, there's the applicant themselves. Um, you may even um, have a family member who is part of the business or operation uh, that is going to appear in front of you. Uh, so in fact, uh, all of you are sort of under a stricter scrutiny um, of your actions on a particular application uh, once you've seen the application and, and determined whether or not uh, you may have any uh, personal interest or conflict in that application. Um, of course, uh, often, the, there are challenges that occur at public hearings uh, when attorneys may stand up for the applicant or perhaps uh, for any opposition and, and challenge 
uh, a member of the commission. And that often happens when a statute, uh, the statute is invoked about planning and zoning commission members having to have no conflicts uh, for the applications before them. Um, and you, uh, this is an individual decision. This is not a commission decision. So each member has to uh, make the judgment as to whether they can participate in a particular application. Um, I know we're, we're short uh, alternates, uh, but part of the purpose of alternates is to help you out so that if you have a questionable situation uh, and you feel there may be a conflict, um, certainly check with me as town attorney, uh, but also uh, feel that it sometimes you may recuse yourself um, that you should not be acting on that application. Um, so I can uh, answer any questions you might have, but I think in re-reviewing the advisory opinion after talking to Greg, I realized that um, the heightened awareness of conflict is already present and with my planning and zoning commission. Um, uh, you guys are under a, a particular due diligence that I know you exercise. Um, and you know those, those that appear before you uh, will give their name, their address. Uh, you know, obviously you'll know a lot about the applicant and you have to um, then kind of search your own personal situation as to how that particular application may or may not be affecting you, a member of your family, um, you know, someone who has, you have a relationship, a close relationship with. So uh, with that, um, you know, welcome aboard to a new member like Ken Petrini and some of the other members, uh, new members that are here tonight. I know that uh, Tim and Greg are, are attorneys um, but again, uh, may make their job a little more challenging sometimes uh, because of the number of clients um, that their firms and that they represent in the area. Um, but I'm always available because it is an individual decision. You often have to, uh, you know, get a hold of me, and hopefully that's pretty easy to do uh, by email or phone, and say, "Hey, Rob, you know, this application came in. This is my situation," and and then we can review it. Uh, and decide uh, whether or not um, you can uh, sit on the application. So thank you. Um, you know, as we as we spoke about several, uh, a couple weeks ago, and I and I know just just so the board the commission knows, when you said we spoke recently, it, it was not today. It was like several weeks ago, so it wasn't just before. That. Yeah. But yeah, a couple it, of weeks ago. Yeah, not sure it matters, but I um, just want to put that out there. So. Uh, I think that this board has been very uh, cognizant of the, the conflict of interest rules. We constantly have people reporting a, a potential conflict or a connection to somebody, and then either saying it wouldn't affect their ability to vote fairly and accurately, and there's no interest in this situation, or abstaining from it. So I, I think that we've been very good about that and, and a little over um, protective sometimes, but I, I had concern um, at least to Tim and, and Ken, that, that I expressed to Attorney Avina that the appearance of an impropriety subjects us to um, a complaint from an aggrieved landowner if they say, listen, you live close to that property that you voted on and you're going to benefit or, or, or not benefit from it. And that's why you voted. And it appears to be a conflict. They open the door to some potentially frivolous complaints when the actual regulation doesn't say it but now their opinion says it. That, that was that was what my concern was and um i i think you kind of shared that a little bit um that view but i just yeah. well i thought we should we should all hear from attorney avina and and ask him any other questions i wish we had everybody here tonight but we only have uh, tim and ken if you have any questions ask them so that we don't run a follow all of this or subject us to a legitimate complaint obviously but certainly not even a a, a frivolous complaint Oh, just curious. I mean, kind of going off of that, Greg. Um, so even if it is a frivolous complaint, what what are what can happen to us as members, and or what is our recourse on stuff like that, or is it or or do we, does it just get kind of shoved under the carpet? I guess. Sure, Ken. Um, there are two basic ways that this can go. Uh, the first that I'm more used to is that if it's a uh, special permit or a public hearing situation, um, 
you can be challenged by uh, an attorney or, or the other side to state that um, since you are someone who's you know with a firm who might be working on a project or live in a particular area, they might challenge you as to whether you should sit on the application. And when that happens, uh, of course, I can help. Uh, but the idea, as Greg said, is that you then state on the record um, your position as to that challenge by by a party, and you then you know either decide at that point you're going to continue or you'll recuse yourself. And that would go into the appeal itself. So that I've had cases where whether or not a party uh, was affected or interested and voted on an application becomes part of the, the zoning appeal if it goes to court. Otherwise, it, it's really going to end there. The second possibility, which Greg alluded to, um, is that someone can sort of walk out of the room and say, you know, I don't really like the way that application was voted on. I'm really not going to take a court appeal, uh, but I may write or submit a complaint to the local ethics commission that I thought that that planning and zoning member um, was out of bounds by acting on it. And so what Greg's alluding to and is correct is that the ethics commission is going to take its own view of how um, we are all performing our jobs and whether we are staying within an ethical boundary that they're defining in this new advisory opinion. And so they could review it and say, well, we might find cause here. We're going to call in the individual and see whether or not, in fact, they should or shouldn't have acted uh, on a particular issue. It's a local ordinance. Um, since I've been here for 21 years, no one has been found uh, to have violated any ethical um, local ordinance of the town. Uh, but it is a procedure, uh, and it's one that you would end up going through. And I think what we are, and I certainly was concerned about the Ethics Commission coming out with a stronger advisory opinion that they're going to look very much more carefully at whether uh, folks are acting where there could be a perceived conflict of interest. And that's a tougher standard, obviously. Someone could be sitting there saying, you know, really, um, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel that this, you know, this application is going to go fairly because, you know, he's a neighbor to the project and he might not think he has a conflict, but I, I think he does. But um, we haven't but seen that gonna, yet. Are we going to get into feelings or are we going to get into facts? <laughs> then, then, of course, if it goes before the Essex Commission, it's time for some facts. Okay. And it's not just somebody's emoting that yeah. they had a bad night. Um, so we will see how that goes. And, uh, and of course I'm involved at every stage, whether it's in front of, with your commission or if it went to the ethics, then I would be involved obviously in the review of, by the ethics, which is highly confidential by the way. Um, so it's a perfectly confidential uh, procedure. So um, just a heads up, I'm sort of making the tour um, with different boards and commissions. Um, but you guys uh, like the ZBA are in a particular position because you're already, I think, much more conscious of your potential conflicts in a certain situation than most of my board members in town. Um, they're not taking the careful review that you do. So would it go to you, Rob, or would it go to Abby or Mark or all three, ask all three of you if we, you know, or should we go directly to Rob for that question if we have a conflict or a perceived conflict? Yeah, I, I tend to be sort of the buzz person that can help on the, on the legal side. Uh, but I think also Abby and Mark are experienced with the idea of a planning and zoning situation, whether your particular situation, you could certainly drive it by them first. Uh, if, if you have that inkling that uh, you may have an interest in this application at first blush that doesn't make you comfortable. Yeah, typically folks will run it by by Mark and I only because, and in part because we're trying to balance quorums and and the rest of it too, just to make sure we're in the loop, even if the advice of, of the town attorney winds up governing how things go. But but, but Rob, you, you represent the ethics board too? No, I, I don't. Um, you know, I try to be the person out there that's helping folks to, you know, understand the rules of the ethics commission. 
uh, once it goes into the ethics commission, um, they basically take it on their own. I'm, I'm not usually involved in that stage. So I try to be more the person out being active and, and helping people. Who, who, who all is a part of the ethics commission in the town of Waterford? Um, you know, I, it's, you, you can look it up. I mean, they, they wrote, the members do rotate. I know um, a bunch of folks on now that have been there a little while and then there are some new folks, um, but it does rotate uh, with the appointments. Tim, you have anything? You're, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Okay, so if we can move on, but let's go to the next thing that we need attorney Avina so that maybe he can uh, exit out if he wants to. And that was the, uh, I just had a question on the cannabis moratorium uh, issue. So if we can just try to skip over to that one. <clears throat> I was speaking with Abby about this earlier today, and I, I was hoping to try to move this toward a vote. And she said that she thought it, it, it needed a public hearing. Is that, and she said that we want to discuss that with you. Would that be, can we take a vote on a moratorium or does it need to be part of the regulations which need a public hearing? Uh, I think I, I, sorry, I didn't really look at that one tonight uh but i'm pretty sorry, sure sorry to put you on the second. Second. yeah that's okay but i'm i'm kind of confident we abby might know if we did it last time with the uh the medical abby so so the way that it, the way we structured it this time was modeled after the last moratorium that the commission did which was to adopt a section in the zoning regulations which require so therefore would require the public hearing because it's a zoning regulation amendment that's what's crafted and that's the language drafted for the commission. And then I think um, Tim had emailed me with, it, with some potential language changes that, that we could discuss. Um, but the way it's been presented to the commission so far to, you know, to this point, I'm not sure that we can get around um, a public hearing. Yeah, and, and again, I, I, I tend to favor those if possible because you'll get a better sense of where you're going forward after the, the moratorium. Uh, you might get a little bit of a reading of the community, uh, which is always positive. You'll have absolute discretion, obviously, uh, to consider the moratorium and, and no doubt uh, perhaps give yourself some room and, and pass it. But at the same time, you'll get some, some responses as to how people are feeling going forward. One, one thing to consider is the the state wouldn't take up the potential licensing until January anyway, and they're still crafting that program. They also can't give the final approval without zoning approval. So we do have a little bit of time here. If, if we were to solidify the language that the commission wants to see, we can bring the final draft back at the November 9th meeting, get the advertising going and likely schedule a, a public hearing. I think December 14th is probably a better one. We we do have a we our meeting our second meeting in November is November twenty third, so that's two days before Thanksgiving. That might be a little bit hard if we're looking to get you know sort of robust public participation, but we could advertise for the fourteenth um, and and invite folks to to have that discussion, um, and then the commission could adopt it. Then it becomes effective before January one, um, and so that we have that moratorium in place before anybody could could attempt to apply for licensing in the town of Waterford. And then that gives us a full year, the way the language is drafted, to consider and potentially adopt regulations if you so choose, or to adopt an outright ban. Okay, so then we just need to talk about the language tonight then and, and get that moved, okay. So can I just, just step back a little bit, just so, I mean, is it required that we actually make a new zoning regulation or add to the zoning for a moratorium, or is there other avenues that can be taken to put a moratorium in the town. So, well, so there's there's a few there's a few different ways that we can can approach it. So the moratorium is one option to give time to consider and to see where the chips are going to fall, which is what the commission has discussed to date. Um, another option is to do an outright ban through the regulations and essentially say it's not a permit. None of the um, licensing models or, or uses listed in the legislation are allowed in the town of Waterford and then be ex and expressly you know, write that into the zoning regulations. If we do nothing, then 
then can, then any of those uses would be treated as the next similar use in a regulation. So for example, the retail sales of, of um, cannabis products would be allowed wherever retail is allowed. And, and so with, with some locational um, elements to it. So, so there's, there's wide latitude and, and, and communities are approaching this from a number of different ways. The last time I was on the planners um, meeting that we, we host through the regional council of governments, Many of the towns in our region um, are, are considering the moratorium. I don't know, Rob, if you've seen this in other communities, but are, are actively considering a moratorium just in order to buy time and see what the state does with the licensing process, just to get a better understanding of how it's all going to go. So it's kind of a time buying. At the end of that, you can choose to adopt regulations to ban. You can choose to not do anything um, and let it expire and, and just have, it, have the uses treated as any other uses that are similar in the district. Um, from a staff perspective and an enforcement perspective, it's easier if we address it explicitly in the regulations because then we have standards we can apply um, and, and that makes you know sort of it more predictable and, and, and simpler for both prospective applicants and if there's an issue going forward. So. I, I, let me just see, Ken, did you get the question that you asked answered? I, I guess some partially, but my question is more, is it, only upon the planning and zoning commission to you know adopt a moratorium versus is there any is the you know anywhere else in the government is there a way to put a moratorium yeah. on i guess that's that's more of my question if if there's a petition i think it's what is it 10 percent of the electors have to sign on there's a particular number of people that have to actually petition and get on a ballot um, for the town a, a question and there's there's very specific language in the legislation that um, sort of says you know we we expressly prohibit or we do not prohibit there's and I, I apologize because I don't have the language in front of me um, but there are sort of three or two or three phrases that you have to specifically use written into the legislation and that could be a petition that gets taken up um, that didn't happen in in Waterford which is why the commission has then been called on to address the issue um, so that it just, there wasn't a, a groundswell of people. What the art, so, so the land use elements come to the Planning and Zoning Commission absent that petition. The RTM will take up the question of smoking bans and um, whether, you know, what properties can or cannot um, enable smoking in public places, including rights of way, sidewalks, outside of public buildings, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's something that'll be moving through the RTM and committee. So this is about whether or not the land uses uh, for the for the various types of license establishments would be allowed. And that that ranges from, you know, dispensaries to cultivators to you know retailers, all of that kind of stuff. There's 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 you know multiple different uses listed in the legislation. Um, what it doesn't touch is medical marijuana, and that is already addressed in our regulations, specifically exempted from the legislation, and that's only available in the medical campus overlay district. Near Smilo Cancer Center. That's the only place in Waterford that can take this. I guess the only thing I guess that answers my question. The only thing that, as the, a commission member, I'm just very concerned about the unintended consequences of what we decide. Um, and we have seen, I've seen just in the few months I've been on the board, there's a lot of unintended consequences of regulations that we have, that, or past commissions have decided. Um, and that's, I mean, I just throw that out as a concern that I have. I mean, you know, honestly, if I'm one person in the, in the, in the overall cog of this, but I just, I know somebody had mentioned at last meeting about um, really getting the public involved in this, because I think it's, it is, I don't think it should be left to a board of five people and, and then the attorney, town attorney or whatever. I, I think it really needs, you know, and I don't know how we promote more public act, you know, interest in this because I, you know, I think there is, I think what's going to happen is we're going to pass something, and one way or another, and then people are going to come out and complain. <laughs> well, I think I think it's kind of important to remember that what we're talking about at this stage is just a moratorium. Okay? Right. We're not enacting any regulations um, uh, regulating the marijuana use. Okay. We're just talking about enacting a moratorium to give us time okay, essentially a year, okay, to come up with regulations, which will also become a public hearing at that point. 
The moratorium itself will be a public hearing if we incorporate it into our regulations, okay? The, any, any regulation amendments that we come up with regarding cannabis sales will also be part of a public hearing because that would be a regulation amendment for those two. So the public will be involved at both, at both stages. Uh, I, I hear you, Mark, but I also see that we have public hearings and people don't show up. So that's why, that's what I, I guess is my, my point is, uh, you know, and again, I'm, I don't know how everybody thinks about this. I mean, I, I'm just, I, I'm just a concern of mine that, that this is an important thing that we really need to think through. It's not, I mean, and I appreciate the year, you know, you know, getting a year's worth of time to kind of really let things play out and, and see what happens. But I also, you know, I don't know, I just, just from a practical, you know, person that, you know, living in a town all my life, the last thing I want, you know, I don't want package stores at every corner of the, of the town. I don't want dispensaries at every, every corner of the town either. So that's kind of my, that, you know, that's coming from, you know, wh where I come from in this, in this situation. Although, you know, the, the medical part, I, I, I agree with, I think that was a, it's a smart thing. But that's just kind of where I, I just kind of letting my my feelings on the on the situation. But I do understand what you're saying about the the moratorium and the process, and and, and I, I'm pretty confident I understand that. I just you know more looking forward and just getting more of the community involved somehow. I mean, and I don't know how you do that, but we have the our, our the reporter who covers Waterford for the day has been pretty interested in the in the topic in general, and so once conversation happens about a potential regulation to address standards or or a ban or however you you wind up taking this um I, I think there's you know we can certainly do press releases and, and we have a whole series of ways we can at least try to get the word out you know we can't force folks to, to show up and participate right. but but we can certainly spread it far and wide that we're considering and want the feedback okay that i guess that answers my question too thank you and i i think ken uh, just to I don't know if this is helpful at all, but I, I think I've been around long enough on the commission to know that um, in Waterford, when there is a, a controversial uh, public hearing before the commission, people do have a way of finding us and, and um, getting engaged. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we'll, we'll get some public engagement through all those public hearings that we have to have. Yeah, I, I think we'll have some <clears throat> for the moratorium. Look at all the attention that the moratorium vote got in Stonington. I mean, it had several articles on it. So we'll we'll get some some um, publicity on it, and then we'll get some activity at the hearing. Uh, the one question I have is, you know, I'd asked before if we could do it outside of the zoning regulations, and I'm and I'm thinking that since if we don't have a moratorium enacted by January first, they can put it anywhere that retails allowed. Correct. Yes, if we don't have regulations in place. Now, when right. we are hearing from right. folks who are working through the state process, I don't know that OPM has the licensing procedures outlined fully yet. And we're, we're talking it potentially it would be one um, based on population, only one dispensary and one microcultivator could be permitted in the town period at this time until 2024. Um, but I think the, the reason for recommending that we get started and move this to a public hearing on December 14th is that it gives the commission time to hold the public hearing, consider any feedback and either make a decision that night or make it, <laughs> you could hold a special meeting, um, you know, before January one and do that as well. Right, okay, so since it's, since failure to act implements the, the zoning regulations on January one, we probably should have it enacted as a zoning regulation. So then let's backtrack to make sure that we get that done is in November, when should we have this this meeting so that we can get it advertised, a potential cancellation, so that we could have an, another meeting and then have it enacted in time? What, what's the time frame we need for this? So I, I mean, I would suggest the regular meeting on November 9th because it's, it's coming up quick um, to formally put out to the public, the Planning and Zoning Commission is considering the following language. And from there, the next regular meeting that's available would be December 14th. If you wanted to consider a special meeting, November 30th or December 7th are also options where you could have a special meeting just on this topic if you wanted to hold a public hearing for that purpose. 
what we need to do is is know what that date is um, because it's we need to be able to include the date in the advertisement. Okay, and then so we don't have a second meeting in November. Your second meeting is November twenty third, which is right. the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Sometimes we wind up as the closer we get to to holidays, folks tend to not be oh. as participatory. So it just, you're fully welcome to hold it then. Um, it's it's just a matter of whether or not, um, you know, you, how how much you're trying to make it easy for folks to, to be able to participate. Okay, so if we had December 14th, we could do it that night and that's plenty of time to enact it by the first. We... Right, so let's, yeah, for, for example, if you were to review the language, hold the public hearing and, and adopt on the 14th, and then you had that 15 day appeal period passed by, by January 1, you'd be in place. You could get that advertisement ready very quickly the next day. So it may be, you know, January 2nd, but that, you know, during, January 1 is a Sunday, so. Um, so we, I think we'd be able to make that happen. Is there, is there anything that we could do or approve tonight to help get that started for you? So what, what would be useful is if we could, we, we had sent around the actual moratorium language that was subject to some modification from the town attorneys. Um, and then Tim, if we can maybe discuss, you would, you would provide me with some feedback, but I think we should probably discuss your suggestions with the with the group here. Um, and if folks can settle on the direction of that language, we will draft that and put it formally together for you for the ninth um, and be ready to go. It's, it's not not big thing. Tim, what do you have for the comments? Yeah, so um, let's see. Uh, the two comments that I had were, um, I don't know if you guys all have the regulation in front of you, but um, so this would be uh, section 3.4B. Um, you know, I, I don't think this is strictly necessary from a legal perspective, but, um, you know, just thinking about the public engagement that we're about to undertake with these public hearings, um, I, I had sort of wondered out loud to Abby if we should add to the end that um, where we're identifying the, the uses that are subject to the moratorium, let's add a sentence that specifically says, you know, by the way, this doesn't apply to um, the medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, you know, I know that those are, are addressed separately in our regulations. And if you were to go look at the uh, public act that we're responding to here, you know, there's a clear distinction. But um, just in terms of, uh, you know, the general public reading this language that we're proposing, um, it might help avoid some kinks in the um, public hearing people, you know, arguing about things that aren't really an issue. Um, the other thought that I had was in uh, that last section D, um, just Adding a phrase to the end that says, you know, um, I think we, we're saying what a one year moratorium here. So that it expires in one year or when we adopt regulations, whichever is earlier. So th those are my two suggestions. So the, the, for the first part, Tim, on 3.4a, uh, that last sentence, that's just, you just want that repeated in B? The last sentence, let's see. Maybe I missed something. But for the last, yeah, last sentence of, of section A reads: Nothing herein shall be construed construed to apply to medical marijuana dispensary facility permitted under section thirteen A point two point two point one of these regulations. Oh, never mind that, that that I missed that 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 addresses uh, my comment on subsection B. Okay, <laughs> and and then D, um, yeah, that's a it's a good comment there. But what what would would we be repealing this section anyway if we enacted regulations? Well, how, what would we do with this section act regulation? I think if it's before the one year mark, I think that you would need to modify this section specifically to repeal it. It would automatically expire on the date one year and, and 15 days from um, that publication date, but or one year from the publication date. But um, I, for belt and suspenders, I would absolutely affirmatively appeal this section and add into the regulations whatever it is you're going to add into the permanent use. Okay, but let's let's put that language in that Tim wanted, just so people can see that it's not necessarily a year if we enact something soon. But but in effect, we're going to actually repeal it anyway. But so, quick people, question: people it, might might it might be easier if people read that in there? Just a quick question. I mean, and maybe you guys can explain, but why do we have to be so explicit in the in the use of subjects to moratorium? Why does it have to be so? Because now, I mean, why does it? Why do we need to be so explicit? 
you know, with, with certain things, because we could have moratoriums against anything if, if we so choose. So, I mean, this, I mean, looking at the regulations now, it says, you know, medical in section B, medical marijuana dispensary and medical um, production facilities. So, I mean, what if we wanted, uh, I mean, I'm being, I'm being facetious here, but if we wanted a moratorium against pig farms or, or, or whatever, I mean, why do we have to be that granular in this? So these, these are all of the uses that are expressly listed in the legislation. If we don't include these, then whatever's not included here is presumed not to be the subject of the moratorium. So those different license types could be allowed in the town at a place comparable in the zoning regulation. So if there's a production facility, it may be in a light industrial zone that allows production. You wouldn't have control over any of the cannabis specific elements of that um, because it wouldn't be included in the moratorium. So they could apply for a zoning permit um, you know, and if it's by right or however else, they could be coming in for, for a facility that you may not have wanted, uh, but you, if you fail to include it here, then um, then you don't get to, to, to ban it. To no. Right, basically. So you to make sure yeah. all the uses are listed. Yeah. So again, I, I apologize. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I do not, I do not you know, uh, go through the all the statute, I know some stat, I mean, if you wanna talk about you know, boating statutes, I'm pretty good on those. I know a lot of the DEP, but- uh, Drainage, you know, just, drainage. You're good and drainage, drainage as well, yes. <laughs> I've done a few of those in my uh, my lifetime, but that's, I, again, I was just, I'm more, was more curious because I know this is obviously a newer regulation that was put in obviously in 2014. Um, and I, I guess, I was just looking at the moratorium language. We could use it for anything if we wanted, if we wanted to study something, right? Actually, Ken, it is actually something that under the court decisions, we need to be careful. Uh, okay. The courts have actually not thrilled about moratoriums in zoning. So they've given us two by rules to go by. This is in court decisions. They said, make them very specific very specific as to what it is you're going to be studying and make them short. Okay. Because that way someone can't say, oh, they're going to study affordable housing for the next 10 years or something. And right. people don't even know what that means. Do they mean low income? Do they mean affordability? You know, it's off to the races. So we are tailoring these and we had good luck. It's often if you have good luck with the fact that we did a moratorium on the um, on the medical marijuana and it went well, you normally want to piggyback and say, okay, this is the way Waterford does it. And you didn't holler last time. We simply now looked at these new uses they're pushing at us. And we decided we're going to stop and look at those two. Okay. Um, so we're pretty comfortable with that um, approach. I appreciate you guys being very... Uh... <laughs> helpful with all this and me not having that uh, the, <laughs> the background in the as an attorney so thank you Tim, anything else other than that comment at the end there yeah that was it i just think it'll you know help manage public expectations okay yep yeah. um can you give us a clean copy of that abby for the next meeting and wait so the next meeting is oh the next meeting is the one that we're going to put this out there the town. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. So I'll get a clean copy to everybody tomorrow. So that it's, a, it's a pretty easy fix. So I will we'll get that clean copy out to you. So you have it ahead of time. And then formally, it'll be in your packets for November 9th and put so, up on the website and all that. So one, one, just, one just quick question. When you make these changes and you cross out and you underline, is there a 3.4 now? Yes. Yes. Which is what? So that, that is the, the 3.4 in the zoning regulations is uses subject to a moratorium. What's in there now is the old reference to the medical marijuana, which expired because the time frame it had expired, but it's a placeholder sort of section of the regulations that any time a moratorium issue comes up, this is where it goes. So we just were oh. modifying that language. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we can just get us a clean copy and then, you know, it, in case there's any comments from, from Karen or John, but I think... Uh, 
I think we covered it. Yep. Protect and I'll make sure you have both just because what will go out to the public is a clean copy plus the marked up copy so they can understand. So that 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 expired in 2015 and it's just been sitting in the regulations ever since for the next the next moratorium. Potentially, mm -hmm. yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we went through with the reg changes and then we still have that placeholder that Waterford has a section where <clears throat> we look at ongoing moratorium issues. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anything else that we have on this issue or can we release attorney Avina to <laughs> yeah, I, I just have two quick things. Um, one is I think it's great that you're moving ahead and I was following and tracking Abby that if next meeting you say, hey, you know, this is what it is and the full board maybe your commission's meeting and you set your public hearing date of December 14th, we will be in good shape because you can also have an action item uh, that night, depending on obviously the public hearing reaction. And then we can get into publication. And then so many days after publication, we're able to set an effective date. So that might put us right at the top of January. So good from a legal perspective, that would be good timing. And, um, and the last thing I know you guys are going to take up later is, um, I'm not sure, Abby, how I was at another meeting tonight, but the Board of Selectmen uh, was looking at the road acceptances, and then we have that set up for the RTM on um, this week also. Um, so if anyone had any questions for me, um, that's that's an issue that we've been asked to see if we can get through the, the proceedings um, all the way through the RTM. Anybody have any problems with the road acceptance issue, Tim or Ken? I don't, I do not. Ken's shaking his head no. Tim? Do, do we have, do we formally have a, a role in the road acceptance? According to our subdivision regulations, you make the reg, you make a recommendation to the oh. Board of Selectmen, they recommend to the RTM because of scheduling issues this week, the Board of Selectmen gave a favorable recommendation pending your review. So their, their recommendation okay. to RTM only carries based on yours tonight. I asked the same question earlier, Tim. I'm like, what is our role? <laughs> but it, it, they did come to us for the application, right? So we gotta okay. follow it out. So. Now, yeah, I have no problems. I, I reviewed the two letters and they look fine. Okay, so I mean, do we need a vote? Do we need a vote on that? Yes, each one independently. And I believe Mark has a report for each one of them that he's going to give you because there's a particular there's particular bond amounts that we want to clarify in the record of what we're still holding. Um, so we should okay. we should make sure we pick a, a motion page. Great. All right. So now, why don't we why don't we just finish this issue then? I guess so. Just so everything's been reviewed and approved by the town at this point. The public works department has has okay. and both and the utility commission staff have both issued favorable recommendations. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, Mark, you want to go ahead? Sure. Which one we're going to work on, uh, Kathy? I'll do C view. That's what okay. I have for C view. Okay. C <clears throat> for C view, what we're looking to do then is two things. One is to um, uh, uh, look at a reduction of the bond that they have now, which is a performance bond, uh, reducing that to 10% of the original bond amount. Um, I have those figures here. And 10% uh, of the original bond amount would be uh, $110,195. Uh, that becomes the maintenance bond once um, RTM approves it. And that bond is held by the town for a period of one year and 15 days after RTM acts. Um, the second thing we're, we're doing here is that there are some additional street trees that need to be installed um, here. And uh, we, have a, um, we have an estimate from, from the developer for those street trees at a cost of $1,650. Um, the town is currently holding as a bond $361,667. So uh, what we're looking to do then is um, Condition the condition this recommendation to uh, to require an additional one thousand six hundred and fifty to cover the street trees 
to reduce the performance bond to 110,195 to become a maintenance bond. Um, and those are the two actions or the two, the two items on this particular action for uh, recommendation of road acceptance. Yeah. Um, so I want to make a motion on this. So, Tim, like you're getting yeah, ready. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, right. I, I was trying to take notes, but I'm not sure I got all of that, Mark. Um, okay. So I, I guess that I would move that we would accept the um, accept the roads of the CVU Terrace roads uh, described in the letter to us, uh, subject to the two conditions that um, Mark had mentioned. Uh, so reducing the performance bond uh, to 10% of the original um, and um, the Se the second condition that dealt with the trees. Correct. $1,650 to be held for the remaining street tree installation. Um, all of this also is well, well here, uh, let me tell you, let me, let me read the entire, the entire um, um, motion, what it should be, is the acceptance of Seaview Terrace is recommending contingent upon approval by the town attorney of all documents, okay, which is going to be the certificate of title and the warranty deeds and any, any easements um, uh, that the town is involved in. Um, an additional $1,650 held for the remaining street tree installation and that the performance bond be reduced to 110,195 110, as a maintenance bond uh, to be held for a period of one year and 15 days from formal acceptance by the RTM. So I, I adopt what Mark just said as my motion. <laughs> so moved. Seconded by? Second. Ken, there we go. All right. So all in favor of the motion made by Tim, seconded by Ken, to accept CV Terrace into the road system, contingent upon the two conditions. Aye? Aye. Aye. Three nothing. OK. How about uh, Catherine Core? Mark. Sure, Catherine Court, somewhat similar, but somewhat different. Um, conditions or recommendation here is the acceptance of Catherine Court is recommending contingent on approval by the town attorney of all documents and that the performance bond be retained as a maintenance bond in the full amount of $46,383 to be held for a period of one year and 15 days from formal acceptance by the RTM. That's that one. Okay. Anybody want to adopt that as their motion? Sure, I'll, I'll do that again. <laughs> the motion adopted by Tim, seconded by Ken. Uh, second. Uh, one, one question I have on that. Uh, is the applicant, if you will, on board with, with, it, with these two recommendations? On both of these streets, I know one we already voted on, but on this one, and keeping the bond for another year, are they on board with that? Oh yes, yes. I mean, I mean, it's written in statute and um, in our subdivision regulations that the bond has to be held uh, for okay. that one year and fifteen days. Uh, they're both aware of that. Yes. Okay. Great. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Three and zero negative. So pass three to nothing. Do we have anything else for you? Uh, Attorney Mina? Uh, I think I'm there. Abby, any other um, issues for me? No, no. The only other similar thing that we have to marijuana is the accessory apartment, the ex and, and sort of grouped in accessory dwelling unit conversation, which similarly takes effect January 1. And so we just need final direction from the commission on where we're going to go with that. And then after that conversation, the last piece that we need from everybody is the grouping and order of operations to bring you final language on the various sections of regulations we've been working on so we can move them along. Um, and that ranges from vehicle pickup windows to multifamily amendments, parking amendments, a civic tri triangle signage amendment, adaptive reuse, um, urban agriculture, Jordan Village, all of those, those things. Um, there are some developers out there who are most particularly interested 
in the pickup windows, the multifamily, the parking. Um, the Historical Society is hoping for the Civic Triangle sign amendment to go through. <laughs> um, but uh, there are some folks waiting on at least a, an expectation of time frame. Yeah, so, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, the one I would just, um, if, and maybe Abby can help a bit, but I, I certainly have heard sort of the unfounded fear issue of where the legislature went on the accessory units and where that puts us if we don't um, take a look at that one. Mm -hmm. So if you know, don't they, aren't they implementing that one also? Um, so, so that becomes effective January 1st. Our current regulations do not conform to those standards. And so if we get an application in after January 1st, we're gonna have that conflict and have to defer to the shells of the state regulation. So what we have is the legislation. So what we will, what we've done from the memo back in the summer was to lay out sort of here are the options. Um, and, and we have crafted a section of regulations that, that I think is substantially compliant, maybe have one, one element that needs to change relative to building height. Um, but that would essentially say that the town is modifying its regulations to meet and to just simply comply with and adopt the state standard. That was one option. The other option um, that we had talked about was the potential opt-out. Um, and that opt-out can happen until January of 23, but as we know, as of January 1, we're, we're in this conflict period. Given the timing of taking things up, um, if an opt out of the, of the legislation and then crafting our own standards for accessory apartment dwelling units, because I think what we do have in our regulations is overly restrictive and doesn't really reflect the kinds of housing people need and, and fair use necessarily of their properties. There's an opportunity here to clean things up and make it better. Um, but if the commission does not want to go as far as the legislation demands, you can do that opt out. But what that means is this commission has to has to go forward with the opt out, hold a public hearing, and then and then two thirds of the commission need to vote in favor of that opt out. Then that recommendation goes to the RTM, and two thirds of the RTM have to vote. Given where we are in the calendar, we don't have enough time to schedule that and get it onto a regular RTM meeting for December. That's also a tough issue to throw at a new RTM right after an election. So realistically, we'd be looking at scheduling something for a public hearing for an opt-out, um, you know, in, in one of the November, or you know, well, probably the December meeting um, or a special meeting if you don't want to mix marijuana and, and accessory housing. <laughs> um, and, um, and then bring that basically, we're, we're, the goal would be to bring it to the February regular meeting of the RTM. So we would have a, a, you know, a month period where if, if an application came in, we would have that conflict, but at least we'd be in line to, to quickly address it. If opt-out is what you want. If you choose to take a look at the regulations and say, nope, what we really want to do is, is have this language come in on November 9th as well. And we'll, you know, we'll take it in and we'll follow the legislation and go forward with the whole thing. You can do that too. And, and that would just be a zoning amendment to be compliant with the regular with, with the state legislation. So those are kind of the two paths that we've we've kind of talked about. Um, I just we, we need some direction on which way the commission is is leaning so that we know what to prepare for and what what to give you to review. Well, let's let's I don't want to do this necessarily without Karen and John for these two issues. I think the cannabis moratorium, I, from what I recall at the last meeting, I feel pretty comfortable that they're probably were leaning toward a moratorium. So that language is good to take up tonight and give you direction. I would say let's wait till November 9th meeting on these and, and get see if we can get all five and give the direction on that night. Okay. All right. I think those are, those are important issues. And that's not going to really put us much behind the schedule you were talking about anyway so we'll always be fine yeah okay yeah. great all right yeah so and i'll i'll leave with that uh and i just want you know obviously my legal uh assistance to you guys is to cue the heads up about what the state might be up to and you know where you might find yourselves january 1st or you know because of these new legislative acts so that's great we covered both of them tonight briefly you know the marijuana obviously and then this new idea about the state coming in and, and telling us, you know, how to handle the, uh, uh, the accessory units. So uh, with that, uh, I'll stand by with staff um, as you go forward on those. 
All right. Okay. Appreciate okay. it. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Okay, Abby, all we have is the um, review of past month's projects and upcoming projects. Yeah, just be before we go on to that, is it is it possible on the 9th, can, do you want to schedule some additional conversation on any of the other particular regulations like the multifamily consistency with statute or the parking, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think I think we should. I just I, I'll probably just ask everyone again, if you have any comments like Tim did to the cannabis uh, regulation tonight or that Karen did previously to. Um, <laughs> She had the housing, she had housing comments, I think. Yep. Yeah, affordable house. So if you have any, send them to Abby, Mark, and to me so we can kind of put everything together and we can pick and choose on the ninth and, and get something mm -hmm. formulated. Awesome. You see anything else big coming on the ninth? No, if anything, we we may have receipt of an application. I don't know, uh, Mark, if we think that the application for the Hendel property on Route 85 is going to be potentially coming in for receipt at that point. It's possible. That's just receipt, though, right? That would just be for receipt if it does. That's right. If, yeah. it, does. Right. if it does. Okay. So why don't we um, just to, plan on that for the night? The, that will have given everyone on the commission several months to comment on any of these drafts that you've given us. If you know, and we can put something together that night and move forward. Perfect. That's good for everyone. They're good, Tim. Ken. Yeah. Okay. I just right. I just had one one quick thing though is I mean I'm a little bit behind the eight ball on the um on this one from the summer. I, I mean I've kind of tried to peruse through it you know week in and week out, but um is there any way just just for my own benefit a synopsis like mm -hmm. I mean it's a thirty page uh public act number 21 i mean i and i've read through it you know but it's like any kind of any kind of statute it's kind of like very dry and there's a lot of things ins and outs what's the general there's there's some good information and summaries from hog and others so Hang on. Can, can we can you mind waiting till next meeting so that we can get john and karen in on it too, in case they have the same questions and. Yeah, oh yeah, no, that's totally fine. I wasn't trying to, uh, yeah, no, I just wanna, again, I am I read through it. A lot of it's kind of like, just, I feel like my eyes glaze over when I start reading through some of this stuff, so. Yeah. Um, do you, do again, you have the memo from July 9th that I put together that kind of gave a summary of our options? Yeah, I, I read through that as well. Okay. And, um, and again, I just wanna make sure I understand the big picture here. I'm not really, I mean, I know there's a lot of nuancey things of which direction we go. I just want to make sure that I understand, you know, what the purpose, really what the purpose of, I know the purpose is that our regulations don't, are in conflict with the, the new legislation, but what I'm still kind of missing the overall intent of the new act, I guess, or the new legislation why it's, where's the conflict and why? And I guess it, part of me is just because I'm new to it. I don't really, I don't follow all this stuff that closely when the new legislation, I just want to make sure that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm informed about what, what we're voting, what I'm voting on. Yep. I'll, I'll forward some of the statewide documents that have gone out from various organizations that kind of give a picture of where things started with Desegregate Connecticut and some of the equity issues and affordable housing issues that folks have tried to sort of put into some of the legislation. And this is one of the things to come out of that conversation. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll forward some of that stuff and, and see if that helps. And then, and then feel free, anytime you wanna have a call, we can we can also chat about it and then maybe do a summary for, for folks at the next meeting. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, how about past and upcoming projects? Yep, so not a huge amount has changed from, from the last conversation. Um, there have been some elements that have moved a little bit. Um, Waterford Woods, there, uh, there's three buildings that the commission had approved a site plan for, and those building permits are all in the process of being issued. So previously one had been issued, the other two are following. So they're, they're moving pretty quickly. You'll see three foundations um, and utilities going in there pretty quickly. Um, so, so that's off of Willits. Um, 171 Rope Ferry Road is very close to receiving their certificate of occupancy. I believe they have a waiting list right now of over 200 people. Um, so it's a really high demand project. Um, 
that's for for 51 units. So um, there's a definite need, and so we'll we'll go through that uh, piece. But we're, we're we've worked with the um, applicant to make sure that the uh, housing opportunity district requirements and everything that the commission adopted are all taken care of and, and filed with the state appropriate. So that's moving. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can still sort of drive around and see the the office building construction at Vago Point in, in Mar Gabriel's Martial Arts. Um, that building is starting to take form, so it's nice to kind of see something that we had on plans um, come to fruition on the ground. There has been some conversation. Um, I, it was just reported to me that there is a potential um, company that is in receivership of the mall proper, this, the assignment interest in the property there that has been uh, meeting with the mall manager and I believe got in touch with our fire marshal. Um, so I was just given that person's contact information. So I'll be reaching out to them to see where, um, you know, where conversation is going in terms of the, the future use of the mall and how that all plays out. So I'll keep you posted there. Um, that just came to us today. And um, you know, again, most of it is, is pretty similar to what we, what we discussed last time. We're waiting on those pending <laughs> applications for um, the uh, the Hendel's property on 85, um, and then the we know that there's another uh, site plan modification coming in for the Willits Avenue project for Waterford Woods that's in conservation right now. We anticipate that coming in pretty soon. Okay, is that it? Yep. Okay. Any questions on any of those? No. All right, so I think we're ready to adjourn. I just, I have to say the way my screen is set up tonight, Tim is uh, diagonal from Abby. And when you reached up and reached for your water one time, Abby put her hand up in the lower corner of hers and scratched her head. And it looked like Tim scratched your head and I had to take the double take. It was probably the funniest Zoom moment I've had since the pandemic started, but Tim reached up, you reached up and it looked like the hand went all across well, that's the That's hysterical. Head. I'm gonna have to rewind and see if it shows up on my recording. You might have to rewind. It was pretty early on in the meeting, but I thought it was very funny. And it, it made, you know, on replay, it might not have been as good as it was live. Cause I had to, I was like, what, what just happened there? Like, you reached up and We're scratched your head. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty funny, but uh, okay, so. Uh, anything else, or can we adjourn? Okay, I'll motion. make a motion to adjourn. Great, and okay. I'll second that. Okay, motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. 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 Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. Have a good night. Everybody. Yeah, have a good night. See you.